Kia ora, tēnā koutou katoa. That's uh, Māori for hi everybody, welcome. And especially welcome uh, Jason McLennan. Hey, thanks Jason for joining us. Um, <clears throat> it's great for you to give up your time to have a bit of a chat about some of these issues. And um, it, it's always nice to sort of meet up again. I, I remember when we, we first met at the conference in, I think it was Portland, wasn't it? Yeah. 2014? Yeah. 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 So years. welcome. Um, Thank you. <laughs> it's good to be here with you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd, I'd like to come back to that conference because there were some interesting uh, things that, that came up, which is still ongoing out of that. But um, maybe let's start talking about something that's really kind of common to both of us, and, and, and that's the role that nature plays I I in our work. Um, I, I often get asked, the sort of classic question is, oh, what is your inspiration or where do you get your inspiration from? And it kind of Sort of annoys me a little bit because it makes it very superficial but the obvious answer is nature and then you sort of go on and talk about how I interact with nature so so what for you how would you explain the the, the importance of the role of nature with, within your work and within everybody's lives yeah well you know it really depends on what it is we're talking about and I think yeah the easy answer is nature right that's the easy answer but of course it's that's that's sort of the a level one type answer <laughs> and the yeah. truth is, the truth is that uh that it's always about context um and if whether if it's a product the context is, might, is very different than if it's a whole building or if it's a whole community design and you can't escape the fact that 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 we should be responding very differently to context than we do uh, typically in western and sort of western design thought um so we look to nature of course very directly but we look to climate uh, we look to uh, human culture uh, and context of the sort of the legacy of people in a particular place uh, lots of lots of issues but um, part of the whole idea is that we're listening to the information that is around us already that that surrounds us and uh, we should be paying more close attention to um, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure it's similar for you <laughs> yeah yeah it is and um I think at the moment, I, I'm, I'm sort of fascinated by the stories I'm hearing. Yesterday, I was talking to a lady in New York, and she said that they've been in lockdown for two months. They're going to be another two months after that. So they're working from home. And during that time, that they, they, there's this kind of need that people are sort of realizing for nature. There was an outcry in, in London when parks were yep. closed because people yep. um, needed to get out in, in, in to sort of see some trees and get out from their, their little box apartments. And I think that one thing that I'm seeing is that, that people are realizing much more the importance of nature in our lives. And, and so, and, and I think that's wonderful because I'm sure you do as well, but one of my sort of main driving forces with the, what we're doing with the design is to bring nature into people's homes, bring aspects of nature like these patterns and shadow patterns that kind of enrich the, 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 the environments in which we live. Um, I, was, I was thinking about the, the bower bird last night, the, the Australian <laughs> bird that, that builds these beautiful nests and, and, and the male yeah. decorates the nest right. with all these bright colored baubles to attract the female in. And I think, I think we're starting to think of doing that for our homes, of bringing nature into our homes and, and doing the same sort of thing. And, and that is one role of, of, of us as designers that we can, we can do that. We can, and that's what I, I really believe in is, is that I think we need to create nests, bowers that now that we're spending more time at home. Yeah, yeah, no, I definitely agree. I think it's also uh, always about understanding the principles that are found in nature and applying them. So sometimes it can be very literal, um, but other times, you know, it can be more about how it's performing and some sort of performative characteristics of a, of a space. Uh, and then ultimately connecting people directly to, to the outside so that it isn't just always about trying to pull nature in. It's about getting us out into nature and not having barriers, you know, so it goes both ways. Yeah. I've, I've always felt that we've, our, our Western culture has been, too disconnected from nature there's been this attitude that it, it's there for us to exploit to control um, rather than being a part of it and, and I really respect and admire the indigenous cultures for whom nature is much more uh, a living thing on, of which they are part and um, and, and I, I try and sort of direct my work to, to embracing some of those values and 
I, th I think I, I love that carpet you've got in the background there. That, tell, tell us the story of that one, because that's lovely. Yeah, so this is actually um, our new carpet line uh, that we designed with, with Mohawk, and it's, um, it's the Owl Collection. And actually, if you were to, were to travel through my whole office, um, you'd see different plumage patterns from different birds from different sort of eco-regions. And mm. so this is the Snowy Owl, which, like me, uh, is a Canadian bird, <laughs> and uh, very striking plumage. Um, and so, uh, this really is, you know, a good example because, you know, we're we're not trying to directly copy nature, but we're trying to have people begin to understand and appreciate the nature that is around them, that might be um, indigenous to the region that they're in, and to get people to think differently about. Um, you know, what they specify and why. And it's a redless free carpet, um, part of the living product challenge protocol. So in terms of the chemicals used, it's healthier uh, and lightweight and, and cleanable and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, it's a good example of the, of the thinking at a product level. And also through nature, we connect to a sense of place, not, not yep. sort of in a general sense of, it, of nature everywhere, but right. I mean like that, that's so the hours. Yeah. is your your it's local like owl yeah and, and and i think that's another important thing that is making people respect the environment <clears throat> that they're in there and now and, and connection to that much more yeah it's about having a relationship with nature and i think that that's kind of been one of the missing ingredients in in design because you can have you can have uh natural patterns you can you can you know mimic nature in certain ways but the the, the deeper level which you know we, we are really beginning to explore is what does it mean to have relationship with, uh, not only relationship with other people, which is obvious, but relationship with a place, uh, relationship with a particular um, sort of set of, you know, weather patterns and, you know, something that grounds you in a particular moment in time and a particular place, particular species. And that's really important to get at. And it's not something that's really been talked about much even in biophilia circles um you know this idea of relationship um and i think that's you know inherent in your work as well it's clear that you have a relationship to some of the species that have inspired you to design your fixtures i know i know you have from some of your stories and, it's, and it comes from familiarity uh relationship requires knowing the other you know you mentioned that in your talk about the the cave paintings and it takes a hunter to, uh, um, to know how to draw uh, a lion because you sort of understand the, the inherent nature and you have a relationship, even if it may not, it, may, it might be one based on fear and survival, there is a relationship there. It's not abstract. And it's going past this, I guess, this idea of nature as abstraction to nature as personal. And then, and that's, how, that's what we need. That's what's healthy because you, you don't destroy something that's personal to you. You don't, you know, abuse it, at least in the same way. Uh, as if it's sort of, you know, distant from you and 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 not part of, of who you are as a person. Do, do you think there's a sense that we're? I mean, I, I've got this from from just the recent sort of weeks that it's almost like we're coming home. Mm -hmm. We're kind yeah. of, sort of finding our place back there again, and it's a sense yeah. of coming home. Absolutely. Yeah, we've lost our way. It's like we've become aliens in our own homes. So we, you know. Yeah because we've become like an invasive species, you know? Yeah. 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 I mean, the, 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 the pattern, the, the model of the indigenous cultures is, of, is, is, is so relevant because, because they're using the environment, that they're living off the environment around them. Everything they need comes from that environment. Yeah. So they have to look after that because if they take too much, they don't have anything tomorrow or the next day. So they absolutely, vital that they live in balance with with that environment and only take what's what's um, sustainable whereas we've kind of broken that mold and we've now got to the point where we've realized we've gone too far and we've got to kind of backtrack yeah no and i don't know if you know the work of wes jackson here in the states so he has a wonderful okay. book, uh, called uh, becoming native to place and it's this con it is this concept of saying you know everyone in some way starts out as an invasive species but there's a choice that can happen where you become native you become native to a place and I think it's interesting, again, I was thinking about your Living Future talk uh, that I just watched and you tell your story. And then I think it was your friend, was it Annie uh, and her story? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Polynesians, when they first came to New Zealand, uh, they, they, were, 
they they were invasive uh, you know they they impacted the, the big birds there they they went extinct but then over time they be, they be, became it became clear to them how to live in that place and then it became yeah. their place and they learned to sort of limit harmony with it until the europeans showed up and the difference is, is we have yet our culture has yet to learn how to be native to a place again yeah. and so we haven't gone through that you know um, but it is the history of humanity where, you know, once we migrated out of Africa, we wrecked things <laughs> along yep. the way because we didn't understand how we fit. And then over yep. time, every people began to learn how to fit into a place. And our, 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 our society has yet to figure out that path. And so we're only in the destructive and basic sort of path right now. I guess because we were so successful at, at being destructive, we just carried on doing it. Yeah, I guess that's probably right. It seems like it's working. <laughs> Can I come back to that um, that conference, uh, 2014? Um, one of the, the things that I remember so vividly from that was the keynote speech by Maya Lin. Mm. And, yeah. And she talked about a project she was working at the time at the mouth of the Columbia River. Yep. Um, and it's a landscaping project to... to because there was a bit of a scrutty park there and, and there were, that she'd been asked to kind of landscape it. And, and she said that her kind of philosophy with that project was to make it look like I had not been there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that that's such a powerful statement. And, and this again comes back to what we're talking about with, with nature. It's like, it's not, she, she didn't want to impose herself on the environment. She wanted to enable what was there in, in a way that made it look like it had, um, something had happened, it was a beautiful place again, but there was no obvious imposition of a designer. And I think that one of the, the, the big faults of our Western design culture is this kind of sense of imposition of the designer um, from above, bringing something down into the environment rather than enabling as a community what's there to, to, to become more what it already is. Mm, mm, yeah, yeah. Well, I think, First of all, Maya Lin has, of course, done a lot of uh, inspiring things in her career all the way back to the Vietnam War Memorial, which I think mm -hmm. changed the way people viewed memorials around the world. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly I, I agree. I resonate with this idea. Um, and I think the problem is, is that designers have begun to think that they have to make a statement with every single thing they design. Mm -hmm. That there's sort of like this sort of, and then, you know, as you talk about, it leads to gimmicks, it leads to... Uh, sort of false branding, sort of like that's the way, you know, it's like Frank Gehry buildings are all like crumpled paper things. It's like, it then becomes devoid again of context and meaning it becomes all about the brand and all about mm -hmm. sort of yeah. something that's done just because, well, that's what I do, which is then that's about ego rather than what's needed. And, and I think for me, um, it's a little bit less about that you can't, I mean, Nature, nature does bold too, but it doesn't do bold everywhere all the time. I mean, so, you know, there, there, there are flowers for a reason, you know, but on the plant, there's a hell of a lot more plain leaves <laughs> than the flower, you know, for every flower, there's, there's a, a thousand leaves, you know, so, so it's not that there can't be these sort of moments. It's just that it's cheapened and becomes about ego if, if people try to, you know, do it for everything, if you will. Uh, you know, am I making any sense? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's about community, isn't it? It's 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 like nature. All of nature is the is these massive or small or whatever scale you look at it. There are communities, and they're all absolutely interrelated and, and mutually supporting. Um, nothing sort of. If something gets out of balance, then it then it, it disappears. It, uh, um, <clears throat> and and that kind of self-supporting community I think is the model that, that I think is so powerful for us as designers to help to try and recreate of, of, of enabling communities rather than imposing that, that mm. sense of ego and, and, mm. and um, so when it comes down to the details the sort of the, the individual choices how, how do you kind of um, how do you implement that kind of philosophy in, into uh, a design project yeah. Well, I, you know, I think it, again, it depends on what it is, but I always tell people to be, uh, to be humble 90% of the time and, and really bold 10% of the time. That's kind of a, a general rule and proportion here in terms of like you, you don't actually, you, you, you want to find a way to express yourself 
uh, in moments, um, but they need to have meaning again. And most of the time, what you're really trying to do is be a member of a community. So if you're talking about buildings, you need to have good background buildings for every sort of museum thing that's out there or, or you know, or it's a mess. Um, you, you need to have simple details, simple materials, and you're not trying to do crazy things all the time. You just need it to work and make the whole better. And, and then find those moments where the impact is appropriate for what you're trying to do as a designer. Um, I don't, that's, that's one, one way of looking at it anyway. <laughs> we could unpack this a million different ways. <laughs> and, and another thing that, that we were sort of um, going to discuss was this idea of storytelling um, and, and what is the importance of storytelling within design and what, why, why does it matter to you that you're, you're telling stories? Well, you're a great storyteller, so I like this to your stories. <laughs> but I think, again, that, you know, I, I think that I, I'm always looking for, for a way to bring meaning to, the, to design, to, again, to help people realize that um, there's, there's, there needs to be a reason for us to commit the world to our artifacts, whether it's a lighting design, whether it's a building design, that that's a commitment. We're pulling materials out of the earth. We're impacting other species. And so there has to be an understanding of why and, and why it's necessary. What, you know, what is the, the life cycle of this object, whatever, at whatever scale it is, what's, where does it come from? Um, and what was the impact of, of getting the materials for it? And then what's its life cycle end when it's done, where does it go? How does it break down? What is it food for? And if you don't use stories, people tune out. They need to understand, and just the nature of humans is you have to tell a story to get people to understand where they're plugging in in that storyline, mm -hmm. and to understand the part that they can play in being, you know, helping to be a co-author of that story, mm -hmm. uh, if you will. Uh, so that's that's you know why I use stories, and again, I'm always fascinated by by your stories, David. It, it, it's a kind of sense of connection, isn't it? That, that it it allows. The, the owner, the viewer, the person, a way into the work. It's it's like you, you can you can just have an object which you take and you put there, and it's it's pretty and it's it's nice to design and it looks good, but yep. it's it's just a, a, a widget, a thing. Whereas if it's got an embedded story, that there's a sense of connection that 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 you can make with it, and it gives it meaning, it gives it value. Um, I mean, maybe. Um, if, if people come into a house which has got a lot like this and, and some, oh, what, what's that? And it's, oh, well, that's a, a, it's a light. It's designed. It's based on a kinna, a, a sea urchin from the seas of New Zealand. And the, the pattern on the shell looks like this. And, and so they're proud of it. They're talking about it and they're telling the story of it. Um, and, and so it, it becomes more than just an object. Um, yep. And they value it more and, and it and enriches their lives more because of those stories of connecting them to the, the, the sea urchin in, in the sea. Um, exactly. and, and so on. And I think that's the other aspect that for me is important. Oh, and that's why good design and beauty is important. As you, as you say, beauty matters and because it, 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 you know, not on a superficial level, but again, imbued with meaning that the people take care of the things they love and they appreciate the mm -hmm. environmental impact uh, is typically lower when people care for something. It lasts longer. People will pass it down. And that goes again back to the, as you're, you're saying as sort of a theme here in some ways is um, the, the, the current modality is to mass produce without care and without story. And it's just about the object and it's kind of a one liner. And, and that's why it's okay in people's minds to use it and throw it away. Yeah. I mean, cause they're not connected anything upstream and downstream to the larger whole. And you can't be connected to the larger whole and think it's okay to throw something away uh, or design something that has toxins in it that's going to harm life upstream or downstream. That's not okay anymore. Once mm -hmm. you understand how anything that we design fits into the larger story, then it has power and meaning. And, you know, that's, I think our job is, or any, any, anyone who's a designer, they have a much bigger responsibility than people realize. I think the average human being might, uh, consume a few things, but the designer is creating something for hundreds or thousands of people to consume. So it's a huge responsibility for a designer to be the one who's also a storyteller that also helps people that buy their products, understand the lineage there that's there, the impact that the product has, because it's your damn fault that it's in the world. <laughs> if you're a Absolutely. designer. <laughs> yeah, no, I've said that so many times that, that, that 
if there's something bad in a, in a bad material or bad process in a, in a thing, we are the ones who are responsible for that. We chose that material or that process or whatever. Mm -hmm. And if that's going out into the world, that is our responsibility and we have to have to live up to that. And, and I think it's, it's too easy in, in the kind of disassociated world in which we live where everything comes from everywhere and moves around that, that, that we, we don't take responsibility for things. It's, oh, it's somebody else. I, I, I just designed this pretty thing. You know, it's someone else's um, responsibility for them. It's, it's not. We, we have to own all of that. And, and, and then we have to tell those stories. And so that, that brings in, um, you know, in, in my team, I've got um, our sort of Ben, our marketing manager, whose who's main job is telling stories, you know, creating videos, photographs that, that not just a straight photograph, but an in situ photograph that says more about the piece. And so we have this much greater, I guess, burden on us now that we don't just make stuff and send it out there. We've, we've got right. to build this package around it, but, but that's such an important package, isn't it? Yeah, no, it's maybe more important than the thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and it's part of the design process so that sure. all the way through your, 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 that's maybe the story is where it starts and the, the product comes along and, and then that, that goes with it out into the world. Agreed. <laughs> um, is we were sort of talking about maybe 20, 30 minutes, and we've been going twenty five. Do you want to? Is it? Do you want to carry on a little bit, or do you want to? Yeah, no, I'm happy to. I'm happy to. Time flies with a good friend. <laughs> <laughs> it does, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I'm just going to have another look at the questions. Yeah, we had, did we have some questions that have come in uh, from, from folks? I'm not so sure. The, the, there was a lovely um, reference in your talk to a book you'd written called uh, Zugenlua, if I've said that right. It's this German word I never heard of before. But I, I, was, I was quite taken with that. And, and do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's a really lovely concept that was new yeah, to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I happen to have the book here. Zugenrua. <laughs> 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 a little product placement there. Apologies. But um, yeah, no, it's a concept that I, I'm fascinated with as well and have been for some time. Um, so I, um, back in 2010, 2011, um, I had noticed a real shift in the way people were starting to talk about sustainability and green building. And um, it seemed like there was a lot of agitation and interest in pushing um, in a different direction. We started to see uh, living buildings emerging, for example, and deeper green products emerging. And, and um, I was having a, a discussion with Janine Benyus that many of the people on the line uh, might know who uh, really uh, popularized the whole biomimicry field. Uh, and I was describing this sort of observed phenomenon that I was seeing of this sort of anxiousness and restlessness for, 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 for change. And she said, oh, there's a word for that. And the word, and I, I mangle German all the time, but Sukanrua uh, is, you know, uh, this word, a crazy word, and it means migratory restlessness. And it's, an, it's a, a known phenomenon amongst most migratory or maybe even all migratory species, uh, species that basically travel to get the resources they need, that as you might imagine, they have to pre prepare themselves for the change. They can't just you know, decide, oh, tomorrow I'm gonna, I'm gonna fly a thousand miles. They, they actually have to prepare their bodies um, physiologically, psychologically, so everything begins to change. They get agitated, literally. Uh, they have to, you know, change their diet, their sleep patterns, and they're preparing themselves for a great journey, a perilous journey in many cases. Uh, and and I think that, you know, we're, you know, we as a species, if you look at our history, we we followed the herds. You know, we 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 traveled behind the migratory animals often, and and I'm sure it's in our sort of DNA as well to have this same kind of sense when the world. And I think we're feeling it right now during this pandemic, uh, not just the fear of, of, the, of the disease. I think there's something larger at play for people and they don't even understand it. It's subconscious and it is this sort of anticipatory 
preparation that society is about to make a migration. We're about to make a series of big changes. Uh, hopefully, we're going to you know, respond to climate change appropriately now. Hopefully, we're going to respond to the great economic inequalities in the world now in a different way. Let's hope. But what is happening right now is this sort of angst and the beginning of the sukun rua for the human animal. And uh, we don't even realize we're going through it. We haven't migrated yet. We're still in the same place. And the resources are getting scarcer where we're at. Winter has come. And mm -hmm. we are yet to migrate. And so that's where all this anxiousness uh, is coming from. And that's what this book is essentially about, about was saying, if you want to be an agent of change, uh, by definition, you're someone who has picked up on these energies earlier than others. That you're somebody that wants to be the, the lead bird or one of the lead birds that's taking off in its migration. And I think, again, that's the perfect role for designers to play. So I hope that wasn't too long-winded, but uh, <laughs> it's a subject I'm fascinated in. Yeah. Yeah, but it, it I mean, in, in terms of the, the context of nature, it's specifically a physical migration. In our uh, case, it's that's a, not. It's a metaphysical, spiritual migration in, in, in my mind as well. But yeah, it's a metaphor too, so. Yeah, so, so how, what, how, how do we kind of cope with that? I mean, what, what, what are we planning for in, in terms of a migration? It's, it's, a, it's a change from, a pattern, a way of living. Uh, yeah, um, the stories have to like it's from it's moving from the old stories to the new stories. That's why we've been talking about stories. It's old habits of how we, you know, how we work, how we live. That, and you have to go through this as you prepare for change. You have to go through a little bit of sort of, the, sort of uh, almost like a depression. You have to get it's loss. Mm -hmm. There's grief mm -hmm. involved because something is dying, even though it needed to die something has to make way for something new to emerge. And there's, that's where the anxiousness comes from. It's a, it's a real, it's a realization that it's not all in your control and it never was that you have to let go and trust and you have to step into the unknown and you have to leave what you thought was the way it was before. And then, and you, then you have to actually physically move uh, and some, in some way now it might not mean moving to another city, I don't mean that kind of move, but move from your paradigm to this new paradigm. And I it's, interesting that, watch, yeah. it's interesting watching the, the birds um, when they do do do, do that, they, they kind of gather in, in big flocks on, on, the, on the telegraph wires, or I guess the trees before we put wires up. And, and they're, they're all kind of getting more and more wretched. And suddenly it only takes one or two. Yeah, the leaders. And yeah. then the mass will all suddenly they're ready, they'll all go, but it has to have those, those few lead birds to set it off, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and that's what we've got to do. We've got to kind of create the new paradigms. And, and, and for me, I mean, I, I, I really believe that those, those paradigms, those ways forward are actually there for us in many of the indigenous cultures. And this is what I've been talking about sure. in the past of, 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 of changing our, um, our relationship with with nature with the land um <clears throat> to one that's much more in balance and respectful um and not exploitative and 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 i think there's that the um pattern is there for us in, in indigenous cultures absolutely and that's i always talk about it it's like you know we our conception of self has to be changed i you know i'd like to refer to us evolving uh from homo sapien to homo regenesis uh you know a, a species that understands that its role is, is as a steward and a co-creator in nature and and that it's regenerating the place that it's in like other species do and and that kind of belief system is already found uh, it's been part of <laughs> many cultures for for many many you know millennia um, but just not the dominant uh, economic and you know otherwise cultures that we have now and so you, you believe that by creating those sort of patterns in the way in which we design and things that we design, we're, we're kind of shifting the paradigm, shifting the, the, the center of gravity of our culture. We're helping, the, we're helping in our small way to get the flock ready to migrate. Mm. And I don't, know what, who, I don't know who or what or which groups are going to be the first birds to take off from the pond, but our job is to help get everyone ready you know, and in, in yeah. sometimes small ways, and that's fine. It, and I can't think it can be, you know, down to, you know, little things in your life. And, and it can be very small to but because it's a shit, it's a shift. And suddenly you can't, 
you can't put it back in the closet once you've made that shift. Mm -hmm. And that's what our job is to do is to turn on those lights in those rooms for people. Yeah. I mean, that, that sort of brings me to the, the kind of, I was going to end with a couple of inspiring thoughts that we could sort of offer up for, for people. And, and, and the one that, 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 that I had of, of this time is that because we're in this situation um, where we're not safe anymore, we've always been very complacent because we're kind of everything's okay and organized and we can do what we want and we have all, all that we need and why would we want to change but now we're not safe anymore but things are changing and so it's a time when what have we got to lose <laughs> what what why not take the step why not do something crazy um uh, it, it, it it's not like we're losing that safety because we've lost it already and, and so I, I like to think that this is a moment of, of, of bravery, of, of stepping out and hopefully, hopefully being those birds, starting the change um, um, in, in, in a way that sort of gets things moving. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I would say that the, that the safety has always been an illusion. And, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and that life is, has never been in our control. And you can, you can live in delusion, you can live in fear, or you can live in hope. And, and the important thing for me is, is uh, not sort of covering one end of the spectrum up or the other so that you acknowledge the, the, the things that are scary, the things that, um, uh, that make us feel unsafe, and you don't bury them or pretend they're not there, but you also don't let them bury you. Mm -hmm. And you don't let them, you know, we're in this moment where I think, as you're saying, um, it's become more evident that we're not safe uh, to more people that, that had a delusion. Um, and, uh, and that, you know, has led to so much angst, but it's important that we don't, uh, you know, we don't, we have to acknowledge it and we don't bury those feelings, but we don't let them overcome us. And there's a lot of people that are, are, are very, you know, giving into it, uh, or reacting very, you know, in the States we have this sort of like, if you're wearing a mask or you don't wear a mask and people <laughs> are like, it's become this sort of ideological thing. And uh, it's kind of missing the point I'm, in some ways on both sides of things, you know. Um, anyway, it's a whole another whole topic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was very taken with your honesty in your talk. I thought, I thought it was, that was very, that was brave. Um, your honesty about yourself and, and what you're feeling and what you've gone through. Um, and, and, and I think that, that that's a, it's a great way to kind of generate trust um, to get people to go with you to so that you, you are human, you, you're not perfect. And um, I think there's a terrible pressure on people and designers, especially perhaps um, um, to be aware of their, their, their kind of image, that they're very self-conscious about their image and trying to sort of make sure that it's right. And, and mm -hmm. our age has become so sort of self-conscious, narcissistic through all the kind of media that, that we, we, we use to project ourselves. And, and so I think it's very, it's, it's great to, it was, I was very touched by your honesty in, in that talk about, about, about yourself. You. And, yeah, Living Future, we just, just had it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. So, do you have any, any kind of final thoughts to round up with that you'd like to offer? Um, no, I mean, I feel like we've, we've kind of landed in a good place. I think that we are, this is the year of perfect vision, as I said in that talk. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, of which I don't have perfect vision anymore, as you know. I used to. In fact, I have it in one eye. Uh, but 2020, when you see 2020, you see things clearly. And this is the year 2020. And I think this is the year uh, where I think it's going to have become more clear to enough people that we have to, you know, migrate to a new paradigm. And so I think that that, that, you know, sometimes life imitates art in interesting ways. And here we are at 2020. And mm -hmm. uh, I think it's becoming clear that, that this is, this needs to be a new change for humanity. And we'll, we'll see whether we're up to it, whether enough of us, you know, do two or three birds leave and the rest stay on the pond, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we'll see. Uh, but I think enough of the birds on the pond know shit. <laughs> yeah. I hope so. Yeah, I hope we kind of pass that critical mass when 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 change will be inevitable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. So, well, great to be with you. Yeah. <laughs>
Th thank you, Jason. Thank you very much for, for your time and, and your thoughts and, and all that you've given over the years. Um, um, it's been a wonderful example and, and re really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I think if, if um, John wants to take over and, and handle any questions, um, we're, we're still going to stay online a little bit to answer any questions that people might want to throw through. Sure. Thank you, uh, Jason, and thank you, David. Um, we've answered a couple of things I've been uh, in the chat room, if you would. I don't see a whole lot of Q&A right now, but as I said at the top of the call, we will um, pull together some answers to the main questions that were submitted if, if we hadn't talked about those topics. And then also, um, we will send out um, a full recording of this talk. Uh, we'd like to share it with others. And um, we, we noticed that there was a bit of a glitch with some people logging in. So anyone on the call, if you have colleagues that, that couldn't get in or what have you, um, we will take care of that in terms of sending out uh, the recording uh, of, of this talk. Um, but I don't see any, uh, any uh, impending questions, uh, David and Jason, so I think we, we can probably wrap it up. John, Great. were there any questions that, that you had sent in prior that we haven't addressed? Um, I think, you know, I would um, possibly mention uh, the living building challenge as, as Jason was talking about and, and well building. Uh, those are two constructs, two programs that designers can access and sort of put some of those principles uh, of, of bringing nature indoors, natural patterns, good product uh, materials uh, that, that don't have VOCs, red list free, what have you. There's a, you know, there's way more to it than that, but some of those things that you were touching on, uh, which are a bit more, more conceptual or, or direction, those can be put into action uh, through well building and living building and challenge. And you don't have to, you know, this, this may not please Jason exactly, but you don't have to have every project be well certified to make it, uh, uh, you know, well designed. So you can take the principles from well certification or living building channel, channel and integrate those into any design because uh, there are some constraints with certification and cost and time and all those sort of things but you can still use good materials good product in every project so um, but other specific questions uh, not, not really I think we've, we've covered a few and um, we will uh, make sure uh, with the wrap up after this that uh, anything outstanding um, I'll cover I will have a look. Um, oh, excuse me. So there we go. Um, so Dean would like to know your lemons to lemonade moment. So David, I don't know if that's a, a, an expression that, that, that is in New Zealand culture. I'm, I'm a Kiwi, but I've been Americanized. So lemons to lemonade is, is, is basically making, making uh, something good out of a bad situation. Um, I was kind of touched. We had a lot of people that were feeling much more connected with their families uh, you know, siblings and, and, and um, you know, spouses and, and partners and what have you, just because we've been forced to get together. So I think myself, quality time with my kids, we've been going on bike rides and, and, and cooking and, and doing all sorts of things. I personally have been focused a bit more on food and good food. So working with the local community farm, you know, they call it a CSA here. Um, so um, others have, have uh, taken more time for themselves, which I thought was interesting. Just taking time out, reading a book. Um, you know, we can't always do that. I think people are possibly more busy than they've ever been. So anyway, um, Dean is asking what, if, if you've had a, a particular aha moment or, or a lemons to lemonade moment that this situation has created um, that you want to continue with. Jason? <laughs> Well, if we're talking about uh, the current situation, I think, you know, John's, John's right. It, it's been interesting how um, I think, you know, people are spending obviously more time with their families at their house, they're exercising, they're focused on, people are making more bread. They're <laughs> I think it's gonna be hard uh, from a habit uh, standpoint for people to be back on planes all the time again, uh, for those that did that or on the road or, um, I think I think there's the I think that people are rediscovering what it means to slow down that we've forgotten over the last 20 30 years um, so it's been interesting to see that shift in so many people yeah I, I, I love to see it I, I've met so many people who said actually I really enjoyed this time 
and and even when you have a holiday you have this sort of pressure to to have a holiday to go and do it whereas you can't even do that you're just here and i think that's that's one of the, the i think that more than anything else i think that's the what i've heard people talking about that, that they've gained out of this and 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 i think we come back to sort of where we started when the talk about sort of homes and the importance of homes and um, it's, it's made me think that possibly in, in certainly in the near future um, we're going to be directing our product line more towards residential than we have in the past and less towards commercial there'll, there'll be less um, offices because people can't get to work because there's not room on the, on the public transport with the physical distancing we have so they can't even if they want to go to work they can't um, and, and restaurants and, and as, as well commercial spaces so I think that we're going to be seeing a shift in what what we do with our work and what the, the, where it's being sold much more towards the residential and I think that's the, that's a good thing because I think there's a more personal connection with the work that people get in their homes than they do in, in, a, in a business um, so I, I, yeah I'd like to see that. Jason we had a talk uh, excuse me a question about the living food challenge that's new to me actually um, but is that something um, is that another one of your Jason projects that you seem to keep adding to the world and in a good way? So maybe you can talk a little bit about the Living Food Challenge. As I said, um, you know, uh, because of scarcity, but also just trying to do the right thing, my relationship with food and, and local farms and, and going to farmers markets and things like that has changed. So I don't know yeah. if the Living Food Challenge is related to that in any way, but if you could maybe comment on that, that would be cool, please. Yeah, no, it, it is, um, <clears throat> it's a, a program that is in beta uh, development with the Living Future Institute. And I see that you have the link to living-future.org. And it, yeah, well, this is a program that we wrote uh, to be in the same sort of vein or spirit of the Living Building Challenge, but looking at, at food, in particular food systems. Um, so whether you're a restaurateur or you are a farmer, uh, or a distributor, um, how you, you know, grocer, you know, baker, brewer, um, how do you create uh, food that is part of a living framework? And there's a lot of people that know how to do that. Um, but there's, a, you know, most of our industrial food system is on the other opposite end of that extreme. So in the same way that we, we began to codify, you know, well, what, what does a regenerative living building mean? How do we measure that? that was what the living building challenge was. And then we followed it up with the living product challenge to say, well, here's what it means for, for things uh, in our lives. The food challenge is intended to sort of frame those issues um, for, for our food systems. Um, so it's, it's not yet a fully active program. Um, I think the Institute's looking for funding for, for it uh, as a nonprofit. Um, but I, I would, it would be amazing if you really knew uh, you know, whether you were buying food, how, how it really impacted the world and not just the nutrition label uh, and or not just whether it said organic or not, uh, but the whole host of issues that surround our food supply chain um, is, was transparently disclosed so that, you know, you see really see the difference in impacts to habitat, uh, uh, to to uh, to other species, to watersheds, to waste, uh, as well as to health and nutrition, which we have tend to have more data on in our food systems now. And so, imagine that that you knew you could compare two buckets of of uh, something, <laughs> or two uh, bushels of corn, or two you know hunks of cheese, and one of them is part of this powerfully regenerative economic and ecological system, and the other one is factory farmed and isn't good for the cows and isn't good for you and isn't good for the land that it's on and 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 but has really great marketing uh, and uses some interesting words but is not actually doing what we want it to do and i think that's what we need more i think most people want to do the right thing but they don't have information and they don't have it presented in a way where it's not information if you have to be a phd uh, you know uh, level person to do the research to decide which it need, you know which thing is better uh, you need, and it needs you know it needs to be the world needs to be curated uh, to, to a large degree embedded and be defendable and transparent and 
my vision for the Living Future Institute is to do that with every every part of society. Um, I, we, we've been working on on declare um, for for some for our products, and one of the things that came up, which possibly is 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 missing, is is it's a bit like what you're talking about with the food about what where the farm um what the farmers like where the food came from how the farmer treats the land <clears throat> it doesn't seem within the product that you've got enough of the um the, the 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 treatment of the people who are involved in making that like yes it's got no chemicals in it but was it created with slave labor in africa um, yeah well that that's why you got to do the whole living product challenge because the declare protocol is sort of a i call it a sub tool it's it's looking at a slice of the issues only and if you want the whole pie, the, the living product challenge is the whole pie. And declare right. declare is like a, an and you know it's 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 revealing one slice of the whole. And because you're right, it doesn't look at all the issues, but it yeah. it was meant to be kind of like a first step to get a lot of manufacturers and designers of products to accept the idea that transparency was a good thing. It wasn't that long ago that you couldn't get any manufacturers to disclose anything about what was in their products other than what they were forced to by, by law. And people thought it was all about trade secrets. Well, I can't tell you what's in my, in my paint. And but that, uh, but that's also a problem we come up against because we, yeah. we often our suppliers won't tell us what's in the product because it's quote trade no. secret. Uh, exactly. That's, but that's the world we need to upend. That's why declare yeah. existed. That was the theory of change model for declare was to poke a hole in that in that process and it was we knew it was going to be really hard at first because it's all this sort of veil of secrecy up the supply chain and and it's but it's starting to work i mean it's really is starting to work as intended where more and more companies realize that the ingredients in their products are are not that secret uh, you know to, to begin with and it doesn't that it's actually better for them to to know what's what's going on than to be ignorant of it so it's starting to work I mean, I, I strongly believe that, that what we've tried to do is be, is be honest. Um, so not just saying, oh, this is really good because of this, but say, but also it's got that which is not so good. There's, mm -hmm. there's yeah, some, some exactly. aspect and, and, yeah. and telling the whole story, exactly. even though it might not sound so good in terms of, of, of you're actually pointing out to the bad side. I think it's far more important to be honest and let the people make their own decisions and then they'll respect you and, and trust you more. That's exactly right. See, I wish everyone had your attitude. <laughs> yep i think people don't want to disclose things unless they've reached perfection already and it yeah. goes back against you know it's like nobody's perfect and you're never going to get to perfect and so you know that honesty and transparency is a is is huge because you know if you're going to get to perfect it's because the whole supply chain the whole community shifted together that's the migration mm -hmm. one manufacturer can't clean up the world themselves they, they're, they can shrink their footprint to a certain point, but a footprint remains. And, and what we need are these sort of positive handprints where as groups of manufacturers, groups of designers, we change the industry together. It can't be changed alone. And then, then, then systemically, we can have a world of better products and better cities, better buildings, um, you know, as a, as a whole. And, it, and it's the, the, the mental shift, the migration, the paradigm has to begin again, as you're already saying, because you're, you know, you have to be, you have to be okay where you are. You have to be honest about it. And you have to then do whatever you can do, disclose what you can disclose, change what you can change, and be honest about what you haven't figured out how to do. And then, and then as a community, we can solve that together, those, yeah. those barriers. So. Yeah. yeah. You, you, you know, Sorry, John. I was just going to say we, we, we're we're hitting the top of the hour, and, and other people yeah. might have to, to bounce off. So I don't want to call stress. Uh, we we may have to have a part two uh, of this talk in in July. You know, we'll let it percolate a little bit. Um, so thank you very much. I don't know if you have any final final thoughts, um, but I think we should just uh, wrap up. I know it's uh, hard to. Um, address every every need and every topic, um, but we're getting some nice feedback, uh, and uh, you know maybe we will have a part two, you know, later on in the year because this really is is a continuation of a conversation you guys have been having for a while, 
more of us are now aware of it um, just because of practical and, and experience that we're all seeing. So it's good, but it's a, a conversation and a process that needs to, to keep going for sure. Right. Great. Thanks, John. And thanks, David. And thanks right. to everyone. Thanks very much, Jason. All right. Uh, Kakitiano. Goodbye for now. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye.